All right. We are live. <laughs> nice. Nice slippers. It, it, it's it's not very really comfortable, actually. <laughs> no. I, I thought it, it's, you know, Adidas, and I'm going to spend some extra money. Yeah. And it's going to look cool, but mm -hmm. not really. It's no. not as comfortable as I thought. No, you should get some nice Bata or Sandax. Yeah. <laughs> How do you know all this Bata and stuff? Like, you did not grow up in Pakistan. It's because, like, people back home, they know sandals because that's all you have to wear. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, Bata. So, yeah, also there's a Bata museum in Toronto. So The same Bata that we wear? Or yeah. is it like just called Bata? And it's something no, else? no, it's the Bata museum. Okay. It's in Toronto. Interesting. I have no idea. Do they like sell sandals there? No, or man, it's it a like museum. It's like Bata's through the ages since whatever they created the company in the 1800s. Oh, so really? it's like their first version and many different. And then they also have uh, different shoes from different civilizations. They have Shaq's shoe. Oh, Shaquille O'Neal? Yeah. Yeah, he has like really huge feet. Yeah, man. He's so, really tall. He's like seven one. So that's cool. So wait a second. I do have actually I've created a very special script and a list of questions that I'm gonna ask for you. All right, I'm excited. And the interesting part is It's like Slumdog Millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Slumdog Millionaire. Uh, that is a good movie. It's a fantastic movie. I when I when that movie was released, actually, I didn't know it was good because I didn't know who Dave Patel was. Yeah. Because like, let let me first open this and I'm gonna tell you why I didn't know. Oh, I'll tell you because it was made by it wasn't a. Oh my God! You got a whole thing for me. That's really nice. Yeah. Uh, the thing about Slumdog Millionaire was every white person would tell you about it. Immediately, it almost made me not want to watch the movie. Like every yeah. white friend I had, like, have you seen? You should watch. And I was just Slumdog. like, oh, it's just like too much. It's too hard of a sales job. So like, it doesn't even want you to know, like, I don't want to buy this. Just, like, I like things come to me naturally that way. Yeah. Like, like I made the decision. But like after seven white friends tell you to go watch something, you're like, oh, my God. So. Yeah, maybe. The reason I didn't watch it because in so... So only in the last couple of years, I feel that I've become a little bit smart. So back then, I only used to watch movies like, oh, Transformers or, you know, I'm like, oh, there's a new alien movie out. So I never kind of took these kind of movies seriously, which don't have like star cast or they are like more story based. Mm. So I was like, OK, there's nothing special about it. Fuck this shit. I'm never going to watch it. And then later, I was like, oh, he won an Oscar. And I was like, oh, shit, really? Damn. Is the age you get to? Where that happens, and then you become like this, like, I'm only going to watch these indie, you know? But, like, for me, it was, uh, I think it was, like, Goodwill Hunting or something, where I didn't know who Matt Damon or Ben Affleck yeah. was. There was no big cast, just a movie. I'm like, this is storytelling, you know? It was yeah. really good. And before that, I just like things exploding, so. So, let's, let's get into the script, and my, so, when did you, like, uh, I know, so we first want to do a little bit of your background story. Sure. Uh, 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 you were born in Pakistan, uh, uh, like, what's your, like, you live in Canada, you live yes. in Toronto right now, uh, I know you lived in U.S. first. Yes. We can go backwards, so right before coming to Toronto, obviously, I lived in Mississauga with my mom and dad, okay. and then when you get married, you move out for the first time I'd live with somebody, and that's, that's the first time I ever got to live, I wasn't like you, you know, this, this so free-spirited... So you, you were living with your... Oh, I had no idea. I thought you have been living on your own and your parents were living... Like, you, you lived no. with them? Yeah, I was living with my parents until the age of 31. <laughs> hey, what are you laughing? 31? I'm oh, looking God. around your place and it looks like a 10-year-old lives here. You don't get to laugh at me. But yeah, 31. Wow. And then... Wow. Uh, so before that, we were in Houston, Texas. And before that, we were in Nevada by Circus Circus. Have you heard? It's a big casino down there. Okay. used to go there all the time. And then before that, we were in Karachi, Pakistan. Okay. Uh, from the ages of like 10 till 3. And 3 to 0, I was actually born in Saudi Arabia. 3 to... Okay, so you were born in Saudi Arabia. Right. And I know this because we were ca because the last time we were trying to record our podcast, the internet gave up. Yep. So, okay, you were born in Saudi Arabia. At the age of 3, you left from there. You yeah. went to Pakistan. Yeah. Now, you can't hold me to this, like, legally, but I think what happened was in Saudi Arabia, they don't give you any sort of status if you're born there. Like, you're just, they give you, you know, 
but they're not going to give you a citizenship because you're born in Saudi Arabia because, you know. So like, how do you become a citizen in Saudi Arabia? I think your grandfather has to be a Saudi or something. So okay. we, we went back to Pakistan and I think, could be wrong, my dad went to the hospital with a bunch of money and came back with a birth certificate saying I was born in Karachi. I, but, you know, I could be wrong. Now, that's how it works. Like I think it, so. Yeah. As a brown person, you're like, yeah, I'm sure you can buy anybody a birth certificate. Yeah, that's like a low level. Uh, 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 that's like so it, common. Yeah. yeah, it's so common that nobody cares. Does that happen in your family where they kind of make you younger? Like if like sometimes in my family, what they do, let's say you're born in whatever year. Yeah. They deduct two years out of it. Oh, yeah. Why? Because in India, so the main source of employment is like applying for government jobs. Okay. And they have like an age limit. Only up to a certain age, you can apply for the exam. Mm. So Indian parents are like, I want my kid to get a job. So they're like, yeah, yeah let me just get two re- years out of his birth age. So he's technically older and right. smarter than the competition. Right. It's just a bigger kid. Just a bigger kid writing the same exam. So it's kind of... So they do that in like uh, Dominican baseball. Okay. So for the same exact reasons, but for athletically. So now you have a 16, I'm, you know, I'm trying out with their 16 year olds, but I'm 18 years old. Yeah, that works too. Um, yeah. Except you got like Indians are obviously Pakistanis, very competitive about school, not anything physical yeah, because we, we don't. Yeah, like, oh, fuck, I want to win that baseball game. Yeah, yeah. nobody could cricket, but any, like, you know what? Cricket is something, but they don't, it's not something they want their kid to excel at compared to studying in school, which is like, Top it's, priority. it's all, like, it's more it's more uh intense than religion i feel like you know this need to succeed at at school yeah because you know the next outcome of it is you sleep on the street like <laughs> it's real out there when you're in a second world third world country life comes at you fast and that is a that's the whole reason they're like yeah you got to study because there's no safety net you yeah, know like so. here if we went bankrupt even now yeah. you can just go and get like a job as a server right and you can still make decent money. Like you make minimum wage and then you make uh, uh, c- tips or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you make enough. You can ap- at least live here. In India, if you do the same job, you're basically taking a shit on the street. Yeah, you're probably outside in a shack. Yeah, you know, yep. chilling with the dogs. Dogs, man. Those are scary dogs. Back home dogs are very different than these. These are not, you know, back home, they don't have specialized dogs for different breeds. No, these are just outdoor. <laughs> we're like, it's fucking just raw. Yeah, that, that dog's real. <laughs> yeah, that's a real dog. <laughs> that fucking bite you, get rabies, Dude. and you die. Yeah, that's that's what happens. Yeah. And nobody cares. <laughs> nobody nobody cares. says anything. Yeah. Like, there are people who die from uh, 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 diarrhea diarrhea from rabies and mm-hmm. i didn't know i saw a video online mm-hmm. so not a nice video not okay. something laugh at but so an indian dude uh, like definitely a poor indian guy oh man he got bit by a dog ah oh, jeez he, he never really went to the doctor yeah he's like yeah whatever and then he got rabies and oh, what really geez. happens is when you get it you become like a dog right and then you get water phobia so if somebody throws water at you i saw this actually have you seen that video yeah, the guy yeah, yeah. bat shit you know like oh, yeah. He runs away. Yeah. So that's kind of horrible. At in some ways I'm like grateful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then what why did you decide guys decide to leave Pakistan? You're like uh, uh, it makes sense though. Like there's no like it's easy like why did I decide to leave India more jobs? Yeah, see you first off were a grown ass. Like you know, you're a gr- I'm I was 9. I didn't decide anything. Yeah, you didn't have a choice. Right? I just went where my parents were going. So uh my dad was one of those folks that uh like a lot of dads, immigrant dads, like he was out of the country most of the time yeah. and he would send money. And that's how, you know, that's what happened. Right. So he lived in Saudi Arabia and he, like, I remember like the first time I remember meeting my dad, um, I was like four and I was just like, Hey, you're my dad, right? <laughs> Cause I would talk to him on the phone, right? They don't have any videos back then. Right. So he'd be like, he'd talk to you. And then when he came like, you're, that's you, right? Because <laughs> I had this like older picture. So you hadn't seen him, like, like was- I. You know what the thing is? I he would come and visit, but when you're that young, you would forget the way people look after. Yeah, like yeah. he hadn't come for a year and a half. Yeah, that's so I went from like two and a half to four, and I had kind of for like it's and also like he changed. I got a different haircut, whatever. Also, I'd gotten taller, so things seemed just everything seemed different. Yeah, you're like it's a whole new world. 
so yeah, we uh, he came, and then we were like, all right, you know, instead of doing this thing, let's let's all move to the states, and then we will first went to New York. That's a big ass move. Like, how yeah. do you even like like for me? It was like simple. Oh, I'm gonna go get education and apply my papers. You guys and back then immigration rules were also very very hard. Yeah. So you were like, you went from there, you caught a fucking plane, and you went to U.S. and you went to New York. Yeah, we went to New York expensive place to go to actually so expensive we also got there in the winter and okay. within two days my parents decided we can't stay here it's too cold it wasn't anything any any of us had seen before like yeah. our clothes were not like they were not helping at all like yeah we visited saudi arabia a lot and then obviously pakistan neither one of these two places can hit you like it's like this it's you know it's proper it's in your cold, bones, cold, cold, cold. cold. Yeah. yeah, it's like you you realize like, oh, this is like when white people say cold, this is what their cold is. You know, when like Thai people say spicy, you're like, OK, calm down. You know, like it's yeah. it was so cold that uh, it scared the crap out of everyone. Okay. And we moved down to Houston, Texas immediately. Like within a month, we were in Houston. Um, and yeah, we had some family down there. Houston also has a lot of immigrants. Not that New York doesn't. But Houston just has, like, a lot of Mexicans. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's great. It's Me- are there Indian and South Asian people, Yes, too? there are. There are a lot, but it doesn't compare to the amount of Mexicans. Really? Uh, I because would they s- share the border. Yeah, it's very close. Uh, also, Houston has a lot of jobs. You can also get illegal jobs. My first job was an illegal job um, because there's more of those than legal jobs. So... You know, like it's that's okay. I'm not judging you for this. Like, oh, I does no, that. no, no. I I am proud that I had an illegal job. It wasn't illegal. I worked at Baskin Robbins. They just pay. They just they pay you cash. Exactly. That's all. No big deal. Um, because somebody who speaks my level of English and who's willing to get paid illegally, they're like perfect. Like it was just so easy to get. You spoke English too. Yeah, because um, we went to. I guess all schools are private schools in Pakistan. I don't know yeah, what a public like, school is, but yeah. I went to Falcon House, okay, wow. which is like a really good school. Okay. And then I went to uh, Beacon House, which is also really good. And my sister went to St. Joseph's. And if you went to a Catholic sound, you went to a, like a really good school. And that's how you know that the, the South Asian guy is doing okay. They yeah. go to a Christian school. If, oh, yeah. If you went to some like random school, like, I don't know. Mahatma Gandhi school or whatever, yeah, then you know it's fucked. The, yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing they don't realize here is like in Pakistan and India, we're trying to go to a Christian school. It's they right. wouldn't expect that, you know, at all. They'd be like, no, you wouldn't. You guys would go to like, no, we want to go. <laughs> like, oh, we want to go to the Christian school. So, uh, yeah, my English was pretty good. Um, and it got just once you go to Houston and people make fun of you at a crazy level, just other immigrants with worse accents making fun of you you start you know i just watched a lot of tv and it got fixed pretty quickly like i would say in four years of intensive but i I did a lot of things that would make me talk to people constantly and i would try to work on like enunciation and and actually yeah it went happen it happened pretty quick but people would remind you constantly if you like rolled an r or whatever it's just like yeah but it's just other brown people so no, yeah, no but harm. the Vietnamese are really, they'll make fun of you when it's fun. Mexican folks will make fun of you. Mexicans are, most of my friends are Mexican. So it was just like yeah. a lot of uh, everybody. There was barely any white kids in my class. I would have a, out of a class of maybe 35 kids, there's like four white kids. Maybe wow. maybe four. That's interesting. That was, is that, what, was Houston the Brampton of United yeah. States. So I lived in Harris County and Harris County is where it's not the most affluent. It has parts of like rich people, but it's a lot of people that are either new immigrants, single parents, uh, drugs. My school had metal detectors and a pol- you know, like we didn't have security. We had a police person with a police dog at school pretty regularly. That's what I don't understand about like American high schools. Mm-hmm. It's like a fuck. It's like a circus or like a battleground. Like if you went to Pakistani high school or Indian high school, it's pretty strict. You wear a uniform, mm-hmm. you go to school, you get your homework, and you're back to home. American high schools, there's fucking guns and there's fighting and there's drugs and mm. I'm like it's like straight out of a Hollywood movie. Like, you know what the thing is? Because I, I was fortunate that I also I did two years. 
like I did all my middle school, intermediary school, and two years of high school in the in what I consider like somewhat of a ghetto area. Yeah. And then my dad got robbed at gunpoint, and then we moved to like a very nice part of Houston, Sugarland, and it was like yeah. very nice. So I got to like see both. Yeah. And in retrospect, it was like a bit like the movie Dangerous Minds. I mean, there wasn't a white woman trying to save us, but like there was a full cast of like different types of people with interesting problems and there would be violence and it'd be fun. Like everybody would gather and watch and yeah, like cheer the shit out of the motherfucker. And like, sometimes it'd be crazy. Like somebody, like I saw a, a girl take out a nail filer and stab another girl in the arm and it came out the other side. Uh, and then, uh, <laughs> this was a, in the cafeteria and we're like, Oh, and then the girl was like, ah! it was like every, Every couple of weeks, there would be something crazy. My God, like, this is one of those few things where I really appreciate being in India because you don't see crazy shit like that no, there. No. Um, I think this is just, an, like, this kind of stuff is it's very American. Yeah, it's, it, it is very American. I don't think this kind of crazy stuff you even see in Canada. This is like... So, you're about to. So, basically, what you do is, first off, you start cutting funding to public schools. Um, in Texas, we had this policy called No Child Left Behind. Yeah, I heard of yeah. that. So if your school does bad in standardized testing, like these testing that everybody has to do, yeah. if your school does bad, they take funding away from your school. Okay. And they give it to another school that's better, that's doing better. Okay. And they're like, you should have their money. Isn't should be like the awful that the people who are doing less should get more money. You're sometimes. a communist, okay, for even thinking about it that way. Like, but uh, yeah, no, it is. It definitely. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, like, you're poor, so you need extra help. It so like, like, you're poor, so let's take our class fingers. sizes would be huge, like 40, 45 students, and then one teacher, and this teacher would be like my physical education teacher was my math teacher. Like it wasn't a in my nice when I when my dad got robbed and went to Stephen F. Austin High School. So Elsick was the ghetto area, Elsick and Hastings, very cool and ghetto schools. Um, and then this nice area, Stephen F. Austin. And I went there and my English teacher went to an Ivy League school. And she had a master's in English. Oh, fancy. You know, and um, all of these teachers had credentials in my other school. <laughs> it was like my math teacher taught us something else as well, that it wasn't their specialty. And they also taught physical education. It was just like, I don't know. I think these people were paid less, so they had to teach more things. I don't know. Okay. But it wasn't the same quality. We didn't have overhead projectors while the other places had like... It was it was, it was was a big difference in the experience you would get from one to the other. Uh, because it was like Saved by the Bell at Stephen F. Austin, the rich school. It wasn't rich. It was just like in a better district. So, yeah, it's coming from more affluent neighborhoods. And it would be like prom. I was a tennis prom king. It was a whole different. I was just trying to survive at the other place because it'd be yeah. like metal detectors. and. Yeah, that's a bit too much, I think. I don't yeah. know what's going on there. I think metal detectors, guns, drugs. I mean, people would bring guns. You need metal detectors. Yeah, I took yeah. my son there in February for the first time. I went back. When you went to Texas. Yeah, I went for the first time. I took my wife and my baby to my middle school and my high school. The same one where Beyonce went? Which one is the yes, Beyonce Yes, Elsick High School, Beyonce. So Beyonce went to Elsick. Lizzo went to Elsick. Is it the fancy one or the rough one? Oh, the rough one. No, it's totally unfair how much talent the ghetto gets. Like, if 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 I actually, last week I was just Googling um, famous alumni of Elsick and Hastings, which are right beside each other. And it was like a bunch of people, uh, famous basketball players, the comedian Mo Amr, the com comedian Ali Sadiq, um, and then like a few murderers. It was on Wikipedia, like a few murderers. Like but like, but they are popular murderers. They are not. They're like notable murderers. They're just not like your run of the mill transactional. I mean, I went to one of my classmates in middle school was uh, went to prison for murder. Um, Interesting. While I was in middle school, I was like, oh, what happened to that guy? Like, oh, he's he was in. Oh, like he went and. Died. Where did I keep my phone, by the way? Which I, okay, cool. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, no, what he did was he robbed a McDonald's hmm. uh, with a blowtorch while it was closed. So you can do that. You can just, like, melt the, gla like, the glass plastic thing and just sneak in. And then he robbed the registers. But there isn't a lot of money in there, but there's a safe. And if you, that's why he took a blowtorch was if you can get through the safe, the safe has, um, 
like thousands of dollars. So while he was trying to get the safe open, uh, the place caught on fire because he's not good with the blowtorch. And when uh, he ran out of there and the fire department came and the air conditioning system fell on a firefighter. And um, somehow through an investigation, they were able to catch him. And then uh, he was 16. And then they tried him as an adult. And then... Yeah, that's where the shady... Shady law practices come in. You know what? Like, if a firefighter dies, they're going to go for, you know. A, they, uh, so a firefighter died too? That's how what happened was a fire, uh, the air conditioning vent fell and f- it fell on a firefighter and that firefighter died. Okay, then he's fucked. So then you that's, that's how you go to prison for life. I'm sure you come out at some point with parole and whatnot, but like, you know. Prison yeah. for life? I thought it was just like three, four years, even for 16-year-old kids. Like, you go mm. for that forever? Uh, so... They he they tried him as an adult. Okay. So what you'll notice is that if you're from an affluent family in an affluent area, and depending on the type of the crime, even if it's like rape, they will charge you. They'll like the judge can show leniency. But if you kill a firefighter accidentally, that's they're gonna try you as an adult, especially if you're like he he had a troubled background, you know, and yeah, like you know, one parent, not even one really, like, but you know, this stuff okay. is yeah, it gets heavy. Okay, so definitely I think you had an eventful life. And, <laughs> and, uh, I'm glad I did. It was fun, man. I, I have a lot of context. You a, know? A I, contacts or context? Context. Like I have perspective on these things and it's good. It's good to have perspective. Like I went to school and Columbine had happened. So like there was all of a sudden like police presence in school. There was metal detectors. You couldn't. You had to wear see-through backpacks. Well, and, when? When Columbine. Columbine was like school one of the major first few school shootings. Columbine, okay, was a shooting. Yeah, it was a high school shooting in Columbine, Colorado. Okay. And uh, it changed the way schools were run (laughs) for like a few years because everybody was then worried about copycats and somebody doing something similar. So trench coats were illegal in our high... You couldn't wear a trench coat to middle school or high school because those shooters did. All of our backpacks were see-through. So they had either had to be made from like fishnet material or like literally plastic that was see-through. Okay. And uh, that lasted for like six years. Yeah. So, okay. So that is when like the Columbine shootings are like one of the beginning of some shootings. Oh yeah. School shootings. That was like the first. Nowadays it happens every day and nobody gives a shit. You know what? Yeah. It was one of the first big one and a lot of people died, but there was also like this backstory, like these kids were picked on and they wore trench coats and they got guns. And like, uh, it was okay. a, it was a big, it was horrible to be honest. What age were you then? I was 17 or 16. Okay, so then you were like a somewhat grown up, so oh, you yeah, know what, what, what's going on. But the amount of police presence, like all of a sudden we would go to our middle school and high school and it was like, you had to go through a metal detector, somebody would open up all your stuff and check it. And um, Yeah, it's not the most fun experience, I believe. When you ha- don't have any other context, you don't have anything to compare it to. It's just like, yeah, like, you know, when you watch the TV show Cops, mm-hmm. I lived in that. Right. So school wasn't something where I was learning. I was just trying to get through and survive school. Okay. Right. Like you would see kids get beat up. I wasn't a very big kid, but like it was a very I would I, I'd seen kids do cocaine in middle school was the first time I saw somebody do cocaine. And you're trying to study because your parents need you to study and they're super angry about it. And they're working multiple jobs. Yeah. So, yeah. What would you say? It's not a fun experience. Yeah, it wasn't a fun experience. But like. It was cool to go from there to a nice place rather than the other way around. Yeah, that's fair. So you went to a nicer place then. Yep. So when did you come in? So where did you go to university then? I did uh, I did a little bit of Houston Community College, got into the University of Houston. And then 9-11 happened. And that, like, all of a sudden the uh, state of Texas made very strict rules on, like, what kind of permits they would renew and not renew, like driver's license, mm. work permit, study permit. So it was a big problem. So I decided to move up here. And uh, uh, we, go ahead. Uh, like I, I saw you did another podcast and you shared your story, how you would, what, uh, and I, you know, I know it's going to be like a repetition for you, but I want to know. Sure. So uh, 
when 9-11 happened, did they force you out of the United States or you just like, okay, you know, this is not working out. 9-11 happened. I'm a brown guy. We just You just made a decision on the basis of safety or you were like kind of pushed out. So basically what they did was they made it impossible. So they said, okay, we're going to do first off, if you're any one of from any one of these 14 countries, they're all Muslim and North Korea. We're going to do a thorough background check on you that might take seven to eight years to do. And during that time, you cannot renew your work permit, study permit or driver's license. Okay. So legally, they're not deporting me. But they're making it like they they make it mandatory for you to like now have to live off of working illegal job. You're not Batman. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to have to live outside the law, like the grid and figure this out. And yeah, it's like not having a driver's license and driving is, it causes a lot of anxiety. Anytime there's like a cop, you're like, Oh crap. Uh, but yeah, not being able to renew your study permit. That's just kind of like, what is your future now? Right? Like Correct. how long can you work at, you know, just a, uh, under the counter job kind of thing. So that's what kind of made us come here. And I think, I probably, to be honest with you, this is probably the best case scenario of that whole situation. I'm sure a lot of people had to get back to Pakistan and stuff like that. Yeah, that wouldn't be nice. That would be like, once you like live in a first world country, like, man, it's hard. It's tough. It, it's flies. Hard. Just flies alone, not even like water <laughs> boiling or anything. Just like, oh my God, you go back home, you're like, there's a lot of flies. Yeah, yeah. Is this fly season? <laughs> and they're like, no, this is just every day. And you're that, like, really? <laughs> that's just how it works. And it's good at least you're from Karachi, which is a bigger city. Mm -hmm. If you go to like a smaller city, even in India, it's much, much worse. Like there's a concept mm -hmm. where they only uh, give you electricity or water only uh, during a certain time period. Yeah, man, we had that load shedding. And like, because the grid would need to shed load or something that it's like, know. it can't take it. So we're going to have to turn it off for a while. And there would be no electricity sometimes for like a couple of days and other times just for like four or five hours. And uh, we used to sleep on the roof. Our roof was just flat. So all the kids, we would like get chathers and just sleep on the roof. And then you could see electricity coming from like miles away. You can see it turn on and it's, and then you yell, you're like, light out of here. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's like, yeah, we're going to take a poop. The generator. <laughs> and I was like, it was. It, it sounds way more romanticized because you're a kid. Like I have this memory as a pleasant memory because I was just like, oh, this is great. Water's coming one drop at a time. So you put a balti here, a bucket here, and then you have to leave it and you can see in an hour you got this much. Yeah, but uh, that's like, I'm not seeing it as a problem. I'm just seeing it as how it is. Yeah, it's just kind of fascinating. But if that happened today, holy shit, I'll lose my mind. Like I know, I we're would, so soft. Yeah. We're so soft. I, I go in the bathroom, I switch on the tap water, and like hot water just comes out of the tap. Unlimited hot water. Yeah. That doesn't happen in India. You need to have like a geezer, like yeah. a heater. And that gives you only like this much amount of water. Mm -hmm. And then you got to mix some cold water in it, and that's it. You can't be like, hey, here's a fucking full tub of hot water. Chill out. Yeah, man. I We have a... Every house in Pakistan has a tanky. Yeah. And, and it's like, like a water tanky at the top. It's a black tank. Yeah. And like when you turn on water, a motor turned on earlier to get the water like in the right place. <laughs> and once a year, I would go to the tanky and they'd put me in there and I would I would take out the two rats. Every year, there'd be like two to three rats, dead rats in there. Yeah. And yeah. that's our water. Yeah, n not good. Not good. I yeah, think. I'm surprised we make it this. I mean, the human body, we can take a lot. I mean, I, I did that. Uh, I'm not going to have any allergies. You better bet on that. And now you're struggling with prostate tests. You Dude, were taking out dead rats. Man, <laughs> it's... The prostate has gotten the better of you. You know, we're so soft, you know? Uh, we are. So, okay. Uh, you Then you came here. Yes. And so, okay, what age were you when you came here? about 21 or 20 2021 it is very really interesting like this is like a classic immigrant success story you struggled there mm -hmm. you came here and then you went and straight went to brampton did you, that's where you went or did you go to toronto and no uh we were in mississauga okay uh meadowvale shout out so uh and yeah uh, we all just worked at warehouses we came and immediately when we got our before I even got my paperwork for work, 
I got a library card. So mm-hmm. I was just like listening to audiobooks and yeah. uh, then our paperwork came in and then yeah. My dad was working at a warehouse, I was at a warehouse, my brother was just a little bit too young or we definitely have him at a warehouse. Mm-hmm. Uh and my mom had gotten a sh- a job at, um, at the mall at the perfume store. Yeah, I think these jobs are so good like in the sense that if you want to get like a start, mm-hmm. you can at least get some jobs and make a living. Mm-hmm. And in India like you have to have to get an education to make a living so you can survive yeah otherwise it's straight to the ghettos like it's it's that bad so yeah that's why like i know people are seeing a lot of indians now in mississauga brampton toronto and they're like oh my god it's going to be so hard for them and it is for as like immigrants is so hard but like for them it's uh, for what they've left they're like you know what i know this housing is crazy expensive and you got to take the bus everywhere but this is still like a step up from you know it's once again perspective yeah like for me as well people like yo the, the housing is so expensive here i'm like bro you haven't seen the housing in india yeah the w- city i live in yeah uh y- the apartment there is as expensive as apartment if you would have to get it next to the cn tower jeez so See? with half the salary i think that's the the like the right way they're doing the immigration the canadian government's like all right where is this a st- we can't get people from countries that already work you got to get people from countries that are having bigger problems than we are yeah so we don't complain we're like yeah. all right this works that's yeah. fine i was working at the the bank and they like people would come here from singapore and they would complain about how things are i'm like these are the worst immigrants they you know they're taking a step down to come here you need people like i'm perfect karachi pakistan houston texas to canada i'm like the whole time yeah it's if like- i went the other way around i'd I'd kill my like this is not working this is the worst movie. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it wouldn't be fun. Not at all. Uh, so now let's talk about like okay this is your story you came in here and let me open up my Sure man. thing. So so we covered you came in here. So now <coughs> you started working in factories and now you have a career in sales. Mhm. That is a lot of, you know, hard work. That's a huge leap. So in order to make that happen, did you like go for education? Like, let's say if there's another immigrant who mm-hmm. is in the kind of situation like you, who has just started. So like, how do you go from working in a factory to like a white collar sales job where you're making good money? So number one, first thing you have to do, and I've given this a lot of thought, and I'm like mentoring two Ukrainian refugees right now. And they're, I met them uh, on Uber drives. And uh, I was just like, what? Because their their Uber instructions were not in English. I'm okay. like, what is this? And both of them are like Ukrainian refugee. Just got here one month ago and three months ago. And this is the this is the advice I would give. Number one, get a job where you have to speak the language. Okay. Getting a warehouse job is good. If you get a nighttime warehouse job, they will pay you a premium because it's an overnight job, one dollar, two dollars more. That's also positive. And you'll have the ability to make overtime and money does matter um, because it gives you more options. But if you can get a job where you have to speak constantly, even if you're an immigrant, if you're coming from India, Pakistan, if you're coming from Ukraine, you find areas of the greater Toronto area that has a lot of those people. And that branch will hire you if you have decent English. It can be under average English, okay. but your origin original language is very good. They will hire you because they have people just like that. So you don't have to have like an A plus in English. You can have a B minus in English and they'll still hire you. Uh, so find something like that, right? Um, two of the guys I know, one of them is a masseuse and an Uber driver. Uber, he gets to talk a bit as a masseuse. It's like it's a good job and it's good tips, but he doesn't get to. So that's, that yeah, that's step number one. And then secondly, you want to do something that gives you some credibility and if you the best way to do it is go to school so you can get the credibility of a school so like oh you went to ryerson or toronto or whatever ryerson's called toronto metro ut even if it is like taking night courses at ut or something um or if not that go to a college that can give you credits towards school if you're of the age do one of those things or enough of one of those things that you can get a job that is from a recognizable place, whether it's a, a bank, a branch, 
and that's really was my path was I got into uh, banking and it was just a so standard investment consultant job. What did you like? What major would you recommend someone who's just like starting from the bottom? Mm-hmm. Like what major did you do? Uh, first, tell us about that. So what I did was I went to college and I got a m- major in finance at Sheridan College. And what Sheridan College does, and this is really important, is that they in your final year, they make you take these three or four tests that are Ontario recognized and Canada recognized for giving you the ability to sell insurance, investments, and a few other things, it's estate planning. So the investments test is called a Canadian securities course. It's, it's kind of hard to pass. And I had to pass two of those. So when I graduated, I was legally allowed to sell investments, which makes me um, able to work at a branch selling mutual funds. And I also got in the insurance one and the CFP, the financial planning one. And it's a three-year college. Now, here's the thing, and this is what I would recommend, is you can go to college to do that. Or if you're a really good immigrant, you can just buy the book for $400 and take this test. And then you can Google when a college is having a career day and just go there dressed up. Yeah, wear a suit. There'll be people recruiting from every major bank, all these random companies. And if you have the right accredit, you're still applying because of this designation. I would recommend, like there are side doors to everything. And as an immigrant, your job is to find those side doors as long as you've gotten the right accreditation to add value to something, right? Okay. And you can understand that and like networking is a part of it, like messaging people on LinkedIn. Like, what would you recommend? You're a, uh, sorry, you're a student uh, advisor. What would you, so, but like, number one, get a job that uh, gets you speaking so your English is good enough and you have some confidence in it. Uh, number two, get something that gives you credibility and kind of specializes you in something. F- find a way to get into an organization, a side door or a normal door. And it's something that if you work at this, there is progression up. It's nothing like I am now a bus driver. And that's good because it's a unionized job. I get it. You're working actually for the government. There's benefits involved. That's not a horrible job. But the progression you get there is minimal. Yeah, there's no promotion. And the growth you have as an individual is also minimal. And maybe a robot can do this better eventually. And uh, But understand that whatever you get yourself into, you're looking for pivots. You're always talking to people, immigrants who've been here a little bit longer, other people who are willing to mentor you, give you advice, and uh, taking control. Don't just go with the flow. Like, take control of what's happening to you. Um it's your jo- that's your job like especially as an immigrant yeah no i think that's a good answer i think uh, <clears throat> a lot of kids i think get stuck in blue collar jobs mm. and for short term it does pay your bills but in the long term i think it's a dead end like mm. like to put it politely like they're not going to get you anywhere you can drive uber forever you can drive you know, buses forever or whatever. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, the best way to succeed is education. Yeah. And now... Now you sound totally Indian. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, like things got to make sense. It's like, true. Even like kids, like here kids I see, like they, like, you know, they are too casual. Like, yeah, they don't work hard. Like I saw one guy when I used to live in Barry. Mm-hmm. Uh, his fa- So there was a guy I used to live in Barry at working at Best Buy. So his father came in like hey i need a new phone blah 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 and i gave him a phone whatever and he told me that he has a very talented like one of those special intelligent kids mm-hmm. but he doesn't do anything he just works at a customer support job mm. minimum wage and that's it like no investment in education nothing so i kind of felt disappointed i was like and it happens to a lot of people but i think like the, to conclude this part is like get an education mm. learn how to speak the local language and then, you know, try to get an entry into a company, mm-hmm. side door or front door. Yeah. And just kind of move to the top. Yeah, and understand, like, which industries are important wherever you live. Like, that's really important, right? Like, w- you can move to a first world country, but once you get to a first world country, you have to figure out what is a first world industry. What is a first world job in this first world country? Because there are third world jobs in a first world country. That is true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a very good insight because, you know. 
there's a stereotype there are too many south asian people who drive an uber or they work in tim hortons yeah. and i think that's where they failed like even though they came to a first world country they took a job yeah i think tim like hortons is a great job at the beginning especially yeah. and then like and then you go from there i think everybody has to do some of those right i worked warehouse i worked as a mover I do not have the body for either one of those jobs, right? Those are not. You can do a couple of pull-ups. I, I could do a couple of pull-ups, <laughs> but like you know, my like boxes and stuff. Like it's it's a lot of it's. It, I enjoyed it because I was you know young, and other young people are doing it. It's it's a good you're unionized, whatever. It's like sixteen dollars an hour or something. Yeah. Anyways, but um, understand that if I'm moving to let's say Toronto, I want to understand what are the the top industries. It's going to be financial services. It's going to be software, right? That's where we and, work. And then you go from that and you can go into, okay, what is what are the jobs at a financial services company from a bank? There are literally hundreds of different types of jobs at a bank because a bank is such a big organism. Software, there's dozens of different jobs. So what is, and you understand this quite keenly because not, you've, you've had to study this and you understand that depending what path you go, you have different stresses, different finances, and different rewards to those stresses. So it's just like as an immigrant, your job is to be not trusting that there is a plan for me. Cause that's what a lot of people do that take this thing for granted. Okay. They're just like, this is where I ended up customer service job. You know, I lived with my parents when they die, I'll get their house. You know, my life is just watching sports every night, uh, getting high a little bit, watching a movie here and there. You know, I go out on dates when I swipe left and they swipe left or whatever. I don't know which way you swipe. I'm sorry. You have to swipe right. Is it? One. Yeah, swipe hey, left hey, is a rejection. Got you. I knew. No, I didn't. Know. Yeah, but don't worry. I'm but not yeah. succeeding either. It's too that's, a, that's the thing. It's just like your job is to make yourself understand that this none of this is laid out for you. And you have to like, you got to figure this out pretty. That's a job. You can't. You. It's so tiring to go to a warehouse and come home. But then you have to spend 30 minutes working on how do you get out of the situation? And that's the hard part. Okay. Okay. So I think then, I think the white collar jobs are definitely a way out of yeah. endless poverty. Or selling drugs. I mean, they've taken that away. Freaking government. Now the government's selling drugs. Yeah. You know, so I was saying selling drugs is called easy money. So mm. like you can make money a lot of ways. So it's like, I don't know, like gang slang, like they use in YouTube videos. They're like, oh, I want to make money. They're like, yeah, do this job, but I want to make quick money, easy mm. money, and that's when you sell drugs. Right. And you make quick money, and that's why I think so many people sell drugs. It's like they're poor. Yeah. They want to get make money, but they don't want to make money the right way, which is the slow way. Mm -hmm. If you want a quick cash, you sell drugs. Uh, it's just a return on investment, you know? <laughs> it's it's an opportunity <laughs> cost of like, if you, if yeah. I spend... You cannot sell it like this. People are like, oh, yeah, that, that makes a lot of logical sense. Let me sell more drugs. I'm for, like, I grew up in Houston and people sold drugs. Like, people in my high school sold drugs. Uh, and people in my high school sold bubble gum. Right? And you would, I would go buy, this guy stole some bubble gum. His name's Luther. And he was my bubblegum guy, Bubblicious. He would sell me Bubblicious for 50 cents. He would be sell me like $2 worth of Bubblicious every day. That's like a normal bubblegum. Like Bubblicious is not a clever way of nope, saying Nope, it's just chewing gum that he stole, you okay. know. But they were because that would sell, you know, a very, di like all sorts of stuff. Um, but going back to the point is that, yeah, there's different jobs and different things you can do. I don't want to knock a drug dealer, but like, yeah, I guess you're right. You shouldn't do that. Yeah, like, okay, we get it. They have, like, you know, different life circumstances. So yeah. So you end up there. Yeah. But, but you, you should, shouldn't do that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't sell drugs. You should romanticize it. Yeah. No, there's nothing romanticized. Those people get shot and stabbed and messed. Because people know you have drugs. Sometimes people need drugs. Sometimes you owe people money. I've seen all sorts of the craziest things happen around drug deals. So. Interesting. Let's. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll move to the next part. But I have a very cool thing to sh tell you. Like, sure. so. When I was in Barry, I used to use the bus. And when I used to use the bus, uh, there used to be like a place where they would put like a poster of like a local criminal who's gone crazy. Yeah. And they're like, hey, have That's you seen... That's so exciting. <laughs> that is exciting. And the weird part is, so it was something related to drugs and cocaine. And there was this chick who had like badass tattoos here. Ooh. And there was a picture of the chick in her underwear posing crazy and and she's like she is you know a drug addict if you see her you get her yeah. i was like holy shit is that what drugs do to people <sighs> and later it came in news she died 
she got shot by other people Oof. because she couldn't she took the drugs she, but she couldn't pay them back yeah and they shot him they shot her yeah that happens man yeah so uh, also do people take kids. uh yeah don't do drugs for many reasons do, so don't, don't do drug kids yeah. don't do drugs only do what are the safe drugs to do weed weed okay what else i don't know mushrooms mushrooms you can do in weed what else i don't think there's alcohol maybe mm, beer beer maybe mdma what is mdma it's, i don't even know it's called it's molly is mdma ecstasy is okay, also yeah. it's all those three things are just the same and what they do is they don't change anything visually Hmm. but they give you an immediate intense dump of serotonin. So you're happy as you've ever been, but you're very much yourself. MDMA. Yeah. Like you ever feel really happy, like you closed a big deal or a bunch of money hits your checking account. Like that first second you look at like, whoa, that looks like a, you know, that moment for like hours. But it, there, there's like, there must be a downside to that drug, right? Like if you take that drug, it's going to be addictive or something like weed, like, so actually, you know what? Let's do the drug section. I had you have drugs here for us to do for this yeah. podcast. This yeah. is fantastic. I had a separate section. Look, let me show you. You're such you. a good host. Yeah, right here. It's called the Weed Expert. Oh my God! I don't know if people can see it. So let, let's yeah, let's transition here. Sure. Uh, before we transition, this week I'm trying to not have any sugar to reduce inflammation. Okay. Which causes like back pains and stuff. So today's my second day of no or minimal sugar, like very little. Being old sucks. It's because you cannot do anything. Yeah. Oh, I can't drink because my back hurts. When I was young, yeah, I would eat garbage. I know. And just I would go. I would run a marathon with my run and in, in Texas in the heat, and I would have had nothing but like four brownies and a friggin' just a Capri Sun pouch, like just a fruit juice and a bunch of brownie. And nothing really <laughs> happens. No, I was great. I was the healthiest I've ever been. <laughs> yeah, you can eat fucking chips, like. Even right now, uh, yeah. like if I sleep at the wrong time oh, and I wake man. up, I can't just mornings are horrible. Yeah. Like, you pay for it immediately. You sleep funny, too. Like it's something that, yeah, uh, your whole body is broken. It's you can tell why like, oh, you're we're not supposed to live for that long. We're like, you know, everything starts hurting at 40. So, dude, I'm 25 and things are hurting. So That's because know. you're having a lot of sugar. Yeah, I think sugar is destroying me. I think that's only the, the uh, honestly, I think it might be the only problem we have is the amount of sugar. I think it's just if you if somehow we can cut down on sugar and fried food, I think we might be like just fine health wise. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think a large part of my diet is uh, 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 fried food and sugar. I would be watching you while uh, we'd be working, and you'd be like eating a bit while we're on the job, and yeah. I was like, this guy's gonna have a freaking <laughs> he's yeah. gonna have back problems. Yeah, no, yeah, that you're like you're like okay, I <laughs> predicted. Yeah, you would drink the cokes of the different colors. Like, is that cherry coke, dude? Calm down. Like that's that's like drinking gasoline. <laughs> they clean things with that. Yeah, that is true. Like Indian mothers like show you that hey, they put this in the toilet. You're not supposed to drink it. Yeah, that's like their way of scaring you, bruh. Let let let's do the drug section. So, I know uh, uh you know a bit thing or two about weed. Okay. Uh, and you know a thing or two about mushrooms too. Okay. And here, let me show you something cool. Put your pants back on. What are you doing? Oh my god. He doesn't have his pants on. What do you have here? So here, so this is some interesting weed that oh, I wow. bought, and even right here, I don't know if people can see it. Wow. So let me show you if you can understand this. Here, I'll hold your mic for you. No, that's okay. Thank you. Here. Oh, fuck. How do you open this? Look at this. This guy has drugs here, guys. Look at this. Wow. That's so colorful. Yeah, it's a colorful uh, weed that I brought. Hmm. And I don't know. It has, like, different flavors. It's it's the colors of India. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, green, wow. white, and orange. Interesting. Yeah, I had no idea. But this is pretty Very cool. political, you rubbing this in my face. If you take the orange out, it's Pakistan. It's white and green. Yeah, that's okay. We'll smoke this one. And so that way... Yeah. And what's political. the other stuff? This other one. Let me open it up. Take a look. I don't even know what's the difference between both of them. So this is made by Good Supply, which is, I think, a Northern Ontario-based company. And I don't know about that company. Station House. Yeah. 
So like, but my question is, I know like, I know you sleep. You told me that you sleepwalk, and that's why you started doing weed. Yeah, I started sleepwalking like when I was in high school. Actually, about that time where the government of Texas was like, "You gotta go." I that's exactly when I started sleepwalking for the first time in my life. Wow. So basically, it got triggered. From I, yeah, this is some sort of later. Uh, I went to like a sleep study. I got a therapist for sleep, and like a, like I have PTSD from that. Like I don't feel stressed walking around, obviously, but that. Uh, it it triggered some it broke something inside of me while sleeping and uh, I also have low dopamine in my system just okay. naturally my brain creates a little bit less of that and that's one of the chemicals in your brain that helps do things when you're sleeping like like kind of paralyze you and I like I move around and stuff so it's it's different so yeah so like when I was getting married I was like I need to fix this. How does weed help you in sleepwalking? Like, uh, like what does it like? W- why did you start taking weed to help with sleepwalking? What does it do to you? Sure. So, uh, I had a really good doctor, um, Doctor Berber, I think his name was, and he mentioned that hey, you have PTSD related symptoms. Like, what do you you know like? And also like I'm a guy, so I don't like somebody telling me yeah. that I'm some sort of wuss, right? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you have the same symptoms of somebody who's like been raped or like been through the military like and seen some crazy stuff and i was like that's weird but also like i've seen some i've seen people get stabbed (laughs) like i went to you know i grew up in a weird part of houston i've seen people you know like all sorts of things like you know things that normal people don't see and uh he reckoned he was like they one of the things you can try is 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 cannabis and uh he had like a volcano which is like a vaporizer with a big see-through bag and um what i realized and what he explained is if you smoke weed it makes your dreams grainier it's not as vibrant and frankly it's not good for you to smoke weed regularly where you don't dream your brain needs to dream to defragment properly okay but it stops you from sleepwalking where like if I'm my dreams would be such that if I was to wake up, I'd understand very quickly. This is a dream. I'm sleepwalking. It's so your brain creates a chemical called dimethyltryptamine, I believe, when you're sleeping. So it's a it's your brain creates it and it has a very short like half life on your brain, meaning soon as you wake up, it starts dissipating. That's why when you wake up from a dream, you can't remember. It seems really strong at that beginning moment. And you start forgetting it almost immediately. Okay. Like that's a normal person's dream. And similarly for me, I would be in the dream. I would wake up. Whatever I was afraid of from the dream is now in my room and it's perfectly vivid. The lighting, the shading, if it touches you. And it slowly starts dissipating just like this chemical on your brain. But that first 15 seconds, I've ran all the way out of the house because I'm really imagining most dreams are scary for me. I don't know. Everybody's different. Um, yeah. You never get a dream where you like, you're like, yeah, oh, let's stick out. Let's hang out. Yeah, yeah. I hope I sleep for 10 more hours. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're like we're in Sweden. Yeah, Dude, what yeah. are we doing? Yeah. Uh, it's like, like a, cr- it's some, whatever I, my brain is great at finding the, the scariest thing for me. And it's not something like from real life. It's like a creature It's an animal that's very upset, but it's demonized. Like, its claws are, like, abnormally long or something. Like, it's more disturbing than normal. But anyways, I would, like, I would see it. Somebody would show me a part of a scary movie, and I'd be like, that's going right in this memory bank. That's going to come out later. Okay. And then, like, I'd have a dream, and it's in my closet, and I would run out. You know, I would do crazy stuff. All right. We're back. So the the dreaming part is... um, I don't know exactly where we were other than like, yeah, my brain projects it and then I will go ahead and react to it. And I'll do like superhuman things. I'll do something that I can't do when I'm awake sometimes. Like what's the crazy thing you have done when you were like sleepwalking? I've moved a cherry oak dresser off to block the door. This is a like a 200 pound dresser. Like I can't, I don't, I can't move. It's very hard for me to move this. I've also like, you you know, like sleeping pa- like pajamas. Yeah. And they have like a hole in the front for like easy access to go pee. I woke up and I had 
I had torn it from that hole and made two separate pajamas. Just t- like the whole, you know, Hulk Hogan, like he rips his thing. Yeah, I, like I did that with that hole. And yeah, that's tough. I woke up in the morning and I like I woke up my brother. I'm like, look what I did, you know, because <laughs> I woke up naked and I was like, look what I did. And then this is a you get these in a three pack because it's from Walmart. So him and I grabbed my other one and we're trying to do it. We couldn't. We could not do it. The both of us trying to rip <laughs> some pajamas out. Interesting. So you kind of had like super strength. Yeah. I also, I remember the dream. Something crazy went into my pants and I had to like, I was like, ah, oh, it's in my pants. Interesting. Yeah. So tell me this. <laughs> w- what what does weed do to your brain then? Do you not like when you take weed, mm-hmm. do you not dream so you don't sleepwalk or does like what effect does weed have on your brain you sleep you dream a lot less number one. Oh, so you don't dream at all yeah like, that's one aspect hmm. you don't uh i wear a fitbit that helps me track sleep so i can see how much time i spend in rem sleep and deep sleep and shallow sleep and you spend a lot more time in deep sleep but you actually need the rem sleep which is a little bit in the between and that is where you're dreaming a lot so weed Still gives you deep sleep, but you need that REM cycle where you're you're dreaming. You're that's a part of defragmenting your brain and having healthy sleep. So that's what weed does. It disrupts that. Um, but you stop running around like that. It's it's just tough when you have a baby that sleeps with you in your bed or a wife. Like I I know jujitsu. She knows nothing. You know she knows none of that. Fair. And it's just like you don't want to sleepwalk you know like it's dangerous possibly i don't know i've never like have you like when you're sleepwalking ever like something like like punch your wife or something like that crazy ever happened i once um i once got really close to her yeah to the point where she felt she was sleeping and she woke up and i was like and i hit her on the forehead and i was like got it and i went back to bed and uh crazy i woke up the next morning and see the thing is i have no recollection of this i have zero recollection you can put a gun to my head and say we're gonna give you a million dollars if you tell us what you did while sleepwalking i will sometimes have absolutely no memory that i even did anything other times i kind of vaguely remember you're like oh i i remember doing something but like i had no recollection she woke up she's like super angry she's like you know what you did like what what happened yeah like like, you got it you you hit me in the forehead and you said got it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and she hit me in the forehead, and I was like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." Like, you have no recollection. That's I did on my s- honeymoon. Is uh, not the most romantic thing. To no, do. we were in Athens, and uh, she tried to pull the blanket, and uh, she was like, "Is it okay?" Yeah, we're good guys. I just keep checking to make sure you know uh, uh, things are just working fine. Don't worry, we will edit all of this out. So that's no not problem. a problem. No, it's okay. Yeah. But yeah, you know, sleepwalking is, it's a legit problem. If you know somebody that sleepwalks, this is what you need to do. Number one, you see them sleepwalking, say this. Hey, you're sleepwalking. <laughs> yeah, say that to them. Direct. Some people don't do that. Because once, because a sleepwalker has a vague idea that they're a sleepwalker. And if you tell them that, they start like, they start coming out of it. Because they're like, am I sleepwalking? And they're kind of embarrassed. They're sometimes like, no, I wasn't. Like that, very commonly, I would be like, no, I'm not. How'd I get here? <laughs> you know, like I have no idea. Um, but yeah, you got to let them know. It's, you can do very, un- people have jumped off of balconies. Uh, a tennis player, uh, a professional tennis player from when I used to play tennis, jumped out of their hotel ba- balcony. Sleepwalking. Sleepwalking, yeah. A lot of people have done weird stuff while sleepwalking. That's interesting. It's something. But it's good to know that, you know, a couple of these. You don't need to do a lot. You could just do like one hit of one. And that's good enough not to sleep. Like I, I smoke uh, marijuana, but like I don't. I have to smoke a absolutely tiny minuscule amount, and then I don't sleepwalk for days. So like that's it. Yeah, I man. thought you like smoke a, like an entire blunt before going to like let's say an hour before sleep, and then yeah. you don't sleepwalk. You just do let's say do one now, and it works. For I days. haven't smoked a blunt. Like that's a like that's a lot of. So what is in a blunt would maybe last me more than a week. Holy shit! I smoked the entire blunt in a you single can. time. You can. You can. Like, is that healthy? Like, like definitely what? not. But it's not unhealthy. It's not. See, that's the thing. The repercussions of this substance aren't such that there's a huge problem with that compared to other things that have like a an 
like an LD, like a lethal dose number for certain things. Yeah, but yeah, this right. is like, you're going to be forgetful. You're not going to have enough focus. But like, how much focus does Sid needs? You know, I don't know. Yeah. It's a pretty so low bar. <laughs> I do need a little bit though, because I do have insanely high rent to pay. And as you can <laughs> see, I'm not the... You're, you got to friggin' finance this friggin' studio. Yeah, I got to finance. So connect it to the device. So let me show you something cool. Sure. Now you can see. So what I'm trying to do is I'm going to get like a cool table like this. What do you think? Ooh, I like that. Yeah, so I want to get like a cool table like this. For That's a, a young man's game. Cool tables. Cool table and it, like and this blue stuff is called something called Epoxy or something. So I went Ooh. to North York mm -hmm. a couple of days ago and I saw some Russian dude. Apparently he's a he owns the shop called Anglewood, and he's an expert at it, mm. and he makes these tables. Looks fantastic. So, But it's kind of expensive. Of course it is. Look at it. How much do you think it costs? $3,000. Easily. And, like, I want to get a large one. Yeah. A really big one, so I can have, like, two, three people. On it? And it's around six, seven grand worth of... That's crazy. Expense. Look at those, though. This has, like, a cool space look. Sure does. That's why I'm trying to get like a license, like a, a G1 license right now. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to get like a G1 license. So you could drive like around. Drive around, do Uber on the weekend, mm -hmm. make extra cash, and then buy this table. And that's kind of the dream. Or sell a little bit of drugs. Yeah, not that's not how you should be motivating it. Hey. I can hold it against you perspective uh, yeah i'm like yeah you know hassan you have grown up there's some things that you should know about your dad i've never sold drugs i didn't even do drugs until the doctor said you know like at 31 the doctor's like it did work though i will say like immediately is that you stop sleepwalking yeah, that's or it reduces a lot i was sleepwalking 17 to 20 times a month before cannabis that's powerful, most man. nights like i would take some nights I would be quietly sleepwalking for three or four hours. Interesting. Yeah, that was, and then you wake up super tired. So you either sleepwalk a long period calmly or very excited running from something for a short amount of time. But it's hard to go to bed after that because you have a big adrenaline dump because you saw a cheetah. <laughs> That's happened multiple times where I've ran from a cheetah. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Like that's I used funny. to share a bed with my brother. Yeah. Uh, before. Uh, my parents, we got a house. This is like in my 20s, this is from ages from 21 till 25. So it's not like when we were kids. And every now and then, I'd run away like there's a cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what happened? Yeah, you know, I saw a cheetah. Yeah. You see, what the fuck? Yeah, and it's different with my brother than my wife because I was. that's when I was like, I got to fix it because my brother knows jujitsu. Like, he knows how to... He could be sleeping, I could be sleeping, and he'd figure it out. I don't, like, I don't want to harm... Har but like, yeah... I'll very often, I would just run away from the bed full speed, and then he'd have to go figure out where <laughs> where I went. Man, that is like so funny. That's that's his like tough responsibility as a brother. You're like, yeah, where did my brother go? Oh, he ran away. He ran away. So you gotta like run out. You of get the used house to it. Yeah, I don't have to run. You know, like running out of the house only happened once, to be honest. But like, you know, just yeah, you gotta figure out where they went. My my wife now doesn't. She's just like he's fine. I, last month I ran into the closet and I didn't, she was like, and I woke up in the closet cause she didn't come get me. Cause she's like, he's in the closet. What's he going to do? Just fucking in the closet. <laughs> so I woke up in the morning. She's like, you went into the closet. I was like, yeah, I woke up in the closet. <laughs> That's crazy. Man. Like, it kind of blows my mind away whenever you tell me that you can just walk into a closet, just take a nap there, sleep around, walk out of the house. This is not a walk-in closet. This is a closet. You walk in right into clothes. And I just stayed in there for at least five, ten minutes. You should record it every sometimes, and yeah. maybe like, ha I don't know, like not that it's an amusement, but it's something that I would pay for to mm, look at. I was that's like, kind of weird, but yeah. Like I was like, this is. <laughs> Wait, that's how I can make my extra money yeah, <laughs> is sending like, you videos of me <laughs> selling sleepwalking videos. I'm like, wow, man, this is some cool stuff. Uh, I would pay for it. 
Maybe, you know what? In Ramadan, um, I go back to sleepwalking because I don't have any cannabis. Like the whole month, I don't do any. And uh, it also proves to myself that I can just not do this. And I start sleepwalking. Like Maybe I should put up like a motion sensor thing. Yeah, that would be cool. You can put like an Amazon camera or something. What if it's like the scariest thing? Like I'm just on the wall, like a friggin' demented. I'm just like, oh, no, I'm oh, not sleepwalking. That, have you seen that movie, Paranormal Activity? Yeah, I'm on the ceiling. You're fucking climbing. My head spinning around. I'm just, Yeah, don't do that. Uh, that, that would be fucking crazy man that would be the scariest that would be a thing that even when you like your son grows up and you're yeah. like you know i used to do that you're like what the fuck man? i would explain to him as a positive like your dad's a demon bro you're gonna do great yeah cool you're gonna i'm a very cool. high functioning i do i have multiple things you know i do a lot i'm a demon that's your dad you come from this stock you know it's that would be stock. a proud son then constantine I think. yeah that's a good movie too great movie fantastic movie give me and I promise this is going to be the last di- uh, distraction. Camera okay. is not bad. Okay. You have to pee? I, have, I need to. Back on. Final glitch for today. Don't worry. Other people wouldn't know because we will edit it out. So we already covered kind of your early life. We discovered a little bit about weed. Okay. How it messes up your... Sh- how it helps you actually uh, with, you know... Uh, you're sleepwalking. Let's discuss a little bit about your career in comedy. Okay. Because uh, not a lot of people know that. Where the fuck did those questions go? Right here. I was like, I had an entire section on comedy. W- <laughs> where is it hiding? So, here. How, number one, how did you get started in comedy? Like, you are, like, you're doing pretty good. You're an immigrant. You came in here. You have a good success. Your career. I was working at Salesforce too, so it wasn't like yeah. I mean I had a job and everything that you can focus a lot on. So how did you get started in comedy though? Like like how does someone like you who's doing fine? Mm. Like, you know what, I'm gonna just start doing comedy tomorrow. So the so number one, what you do, what I did was I tore my ACL. Right? <laughs> That's step one. Mark Zuckerberg also tore his ACL like a couple of days ago. Same thing, exactly. Like all successful people are doing it lately. So I uh, I tore my ACL playing, uh, doing jujitsu and basketball. Specifically, okay. I tweaked to doing jujitsu, and then I completely tore it doing basketball. And then immediately after, like seven months after that, I was getting married. They hadn't even given me my date to get the surgery, and I got married. I moved to Toronto away from my friends and family, and that will give you depression and then you get really sad because uh you can't do i didn't realize this i didn't realize that doing physical activity was my creative outlet i thought that was my physical outlet doing jujitsu basketball tennis getting rid of like the extra energy you have i just thought it was like a physical activity it's the most creative things i do are expressing myself with my body athletically like, that's the only place I realized I felt free. So when that is taken away from you... Um, then your legs, your yeah, ACL gets torn away. Which is a very important part of your mobility. There's nothing you can do without having... If you don't have an ACL, your leg buckles and sometimes bends backwards. And it's uh, it Damn. makes lateral movements very hard. So while I was doing that... Lots of negatives, you know, got new marriage, trying to get used to living with somebody, waking up beside them, sleepwalking, whatever, all those adjustments. Uh, You're not around your friends, your family as much. It's winter. And I started riding my bicycle as a part of keeping my legs strong. You can do that. And I came across one night around 10, 1030. I heard a bunch of people laughing at like a little bar cafe kind of thing and i went where inside. was it again Toronto? this was i want to say this was the ossington okay it was uh, on the ossington and i forgot it's like ossington dundas area um and it was just like this back of a bar that had a small room and you can hear people laughing and it was okay. an open mic every monday so i went in i just saw it you know just like oh yes it's no for an open mic it's free yeah and most of the people are just waiting to go up do stand-up comedy and they're all horrible even the yeah. good ones are just doing new material to, it's an open mic. So I, I was like, oh, this is what I, you know, I was like, this is what they talk about on podcasts is this. It's just like, this is an open mic. This is what stand-up comedians do. And this is, I just stumbled upon one magically, you know. Right. 
And I, I came back to it three, four weeks in a row just to watch. And it's just so bad what people are like, you know what? I can try this. It's all people just trying. A lot of them also doing it for the first time. Like, and the way it works is you go there. They put out a sheet at five when this bar opens and you write your name down. The show is not going to be starting till eight or nine. You write your name down. And once you get there in guy, girl order, boy, girl, boy, girl, they go through the whole list. And this place is open from eight. It starts open mic and it ends at like one. Okay. Wow. That's a, that's a long open night, man. That's a normal. Yeah. There'd be a lot of open mics that way. Open. I mean, if you think sales is a grind and this is like a special type of like not everybody is built for it. Yeah. Open micing being a comedian is more of a grind the way you get good at what you need to do. And it's, widely understood this is the only way to get good at it is putting in these like just sometimes i just like okay now i have to go it's midnight you know like i gotta shift like i gotta still go into work at seven at sales or so it's an important job it's a very competitive job you're lucky to have it but you're you know you're doing a lot of your this this is what you do and the cool thing is also realizing that like i can go present in England on a yacht to a board to a group of board members. I'm staying on this yacht. It's over 1000 euros to stay on this yacht a night and doing this presentation that goes well, does not feel half as good as doing an open mic that pays you nothing in front of half drunks and homeless people and comedians. So, uh, that's how I started doing it. And, um, I got good at it pretty quickly because I was older than most. Most people have no experience. And what age did you start at comedy? 32, 33. That's extremely old for this industry. Oh, oh, really? Like, do most people start like in high school or something? In their 20s. Uh, and some people in high school, like I think Dave Chappelle, first time did stand up at 16. Uh, most people start in their 20s. 20, 21, 24, 26 maybe. Very few people start in their 30s. Um but I, you know, you're living in the city. You hate being home. <laughs> it's the only thing that makes you happy. You need a little bit of sadness. It does help to like have something driving you. Also, like I have a very silly brain, like the amount of silly thoughts I have that I write down that I, yeah, I have, you know, like it, you can, your brain can be talented at coming up with premises, but then it's all work after that. It's all like getting it in the right spot, explaining in the right way, moving things around and have sometimes you do it and nobody, they're like, no, that's, that's not funny. Nobody laughs. Nobody even smiles. You're like, all right, thank you. I agree. I agree. That was, that was a wild one. But okay. you do that for eight years and you get to get better at your craft like anything else. And eventually you start doing better shows. You start headlining shows. You get an invitation to just for laughs. You, it validates a lot of things, but it's, I mean, it's real as you make it. It's completely entrepreneurial. There is nobody telling you your next show is here. You got to ask for it. You got to, it's like sales. It's just like sales. So how did you end up in Just for Laughs? So right now you were telling me you, so let me tell to the audience that he performed at Just for Laughs, which is a big deal. It's a big festival, yeah. It's a big festival. So how does someone start so late in comedy and still end up doing just for laughs like what's the process someone to get selected in just for laughs like oh, how, how did sure. you get selected so there's a, a few different ways just like the immigrant thing we were talking about you can get into these things a few different angles a few different ways so yeah you can take the standard i go into college and i got this job so just for laughs um toronto is one of those hubs of comedy toronto chicago New York, these are the main, you know, some of the main cities that comedy exists, Los Angeles. So talent scouts or the person that is looking for talent for the festival will go to these cities and watch hundreds of comedians to narrow that down to like somewhere between, I think, 40 to 60 that will be at a festival. And they will do a lot of different types. Some are filler spots. This whole show is like this. Other people are opening for other major comedians, but you, they're, they literally come and watch you, and based off your set, they decide, I'm like, this guy wasn't even taking notes when he watched me. So it's kind of like, it can be also very frustrating. Like, why aren't you writing stuff down? Is there, you know, write my name, right? Make, make yeah, it like yeah. a letter or something. Like a Take a note, you know, like yeah. you're paying attention. But anyways, um, 
a lot of hard work and yeah, you, you're kind of trying out to be on these bigger and bigger shows and you get invited to then do a show for a talent coordinator. His name is Neil. Um, and hopefully he likes you. And if he likes you, he either gives you a feature spot, which is a certain level. Um, so I did that. You came out to the show. Thank you for coming out. Um, the way I got into this one was just for laughs decided they wanted to have a, a show that was showcasing Toronto's best Asian comedians. And last few years, a lot of those shows were like the best gay comedians. Okay. so And this year they were like, Hey, let's have a Caribbean show. Let's have a, you know, Asian show. They still had gay stuff too. And, uh, but yeah, I was like, I, I got asked to be on one of those Asian shows. And I was like, yeah, I am definitely like. Definitely Asian. I can confirm. Yeah. And I can definitely say, as far as the Asians go, I'm one of the better ones in this. Like, I I can say I, that's an earned spot. You know, there's not too many. I'm like number one uh, in Pakistanis. Zan Ali. I said it. That's another. He's really funny. He's Pakistani. And, Is he in uh, Toronto too? Yeah, really funny guy, man. Really funny guy. He, uh, I'll take you to one of his shows. But yeah, great experience. Got to go to the after party. I also like went to a bunch of shows just to watch because I was just like, this is great. You're doing a festival. You're watching festival. You go to the after party. A lot of the comedians are there. There's a fist fight with two comedians. Hilarious. Like I got there right after it. I was like, I asked my buddy. I'm like, hey, Hisham, why is uh, I'm not going to name the people that punched each other or whatever. I'm like, Was why it like this? celebrities? I know them. They're like they do well, but they aren't like well known. It's not like okay. they're not on Netflix. They don't okay. have names, but I know them. They're and uh, popular. yeah, it's probably embarrassing for both of them. But it was like that's the kind of stuff that I like. I do comedy because it is a wild and fun. Sometimes they try to pay you in cocaine. Sometimes it's edibles. You know, like it's just I like that weird stuff. I've seen a guy, you know, get heckled, say something to the heckler, and I've seen the heckler take his pants off, show him, show the, the comedian his asshole. It's a fun story for me. I love I love that, you know, you do outdoor shows by a dumpster and there's people like 40 students are there to watch you. I'm like, how is this a thing? Like, how is this? It's t- totally a performance. It's an art. And this is fun that it's a show. But it's interesting that uh, this is this is comedy lives in such weird places where you're like, no one's going to come out to this. This is a rooftop. And then they'll be like packed. The whole rooftop is full. Because people want to watch comedy in the pandemic, even if it's socially distanced and whatnot. So it's just like, it's a fun thing to get. I know there's a lot of fun things to do if you want to be an artist or whatever. But it's like, this is fun. No, I think, and one of the reasons is that a lot of people appreciate like amateur comedian because there's a lot of original material, not just, you know, random stuff that like, you know, there is a lot of jokes and there's a lot of material that's written in Netflix and it's commercial, but it's a lot more fun to know that you live in a city and these people you share the community with and they're doing something cool and you kind of want to support them. And I think, I think it's fun. You get to see different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely an appeal to it. And it's literally like, you'll do a show, you go watch a show and it's just a normal Wednesday night comedy bar show. This comedian is like an amateur. They've been doing it for two years. This other comedian's been on Conan. Like, it's just a very common thing where, like... I saw that Conan guy, too, you know? Like, just down under. You said there's, like, a comedy club here or whatever. Sure. Yeah, the Conan guy keeps roaming around here. Yeah, Mark uh, Mark Little, I think, is his name. Yeah, like But there's a few, it. and they're, like, really, really funny. And they're just... Every night, they're doing stand-up comedy for, like, 18 to 20 bucks, along with a bunch of other great comedians. So it's just, like... I like that I get to do what I do in the daytime, which is your nonsense. It's like, you know, cold call structure, making yeah, dashboards. Yeah. But at night, I'm an outdoor cat and I'm peeing on the wall. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I, but you know what I mean? It's like you're, you're living the life. Uh, I think it's really enjoyable. Yeah. Like, like, OK, no offense against anyone. We do this job. We make a living. Great. But sometimes, you know, you don't really feel alive doing it. When I'm like, even I'm doing this, like podcast, whatever, we had to do a couple shots again. And I'm just will confirm whether it's still recording so we don't get, you know, uh, betrayed by the camera and it's working. But it's like, when I do this, you feel fucking alive. You feel like you're living it. Mm-hmm. When I do like my corporate job where I feel like it's okay, it's not bad, but I'm like... <sighs> I think I'm we're like, supposed to. I think as humans, if you were to like look at what makes us happy, a part of it is stuff that is creative and collaborative and 
even if it's not collaborative, creative, I think it's it's something we completely underestimate in um, life satisfaction. Yeah, like I definitely get a lot of life. Sa- I'm getting the life satisfaction now. And I think this is like one of my goals. I want to do this thing. And it's really fun. And it's thanks to people like you who are patient and are here on a Tuesday night when their wife is calling them. But you're like, you know what? I'm committed to this podcast. I'm going to drive on the fucking highway on Toronto traffic and, you know, get through this. How was seeing Andrew Schultz? Did you meet him in the after party? Was he there? No, man. I Who did I get to meet? I saw... I only got to see two people. Ronnie Chang. And, oh, nice. And Ron Funches, who's a, a really funny comedian that I like a lot, and he's on TV. I think he's on Netflix as well. Andrew Schultz, I just went to watch him at the Scotiabank Arena. I saw Marlon Waynes, who's a really funny comedian. Um, Andrew Schultz was fantastic. Like... You would think you would lose a lot being in a big stadium, and you do, but this guy is, man, the, it was a fantastic A+. Plus. And I see a lot of, I like, in the last two years, I've seen everybody. I've seen Chris Rock, Bill Burr, Dave Chappelle, Hassan Minhaj, Ronnie Chang twice, um, Andrew Schultz twice, Theo Vaughn, Sam Morrill, Mark Norman. Uh, I see a lot of comedy, but um, Andrew Schultz live is something to watch, man. This guy is a very good comedian. He's so on top of current events and what people's palate is in terms of what's funny and whatnot, and he has great observations. Like, it's not... Like, my friend took his wife, and she's not a fan, but she's, like, laughed her butt off. He's so good. He's so funny. Highly recommend. Did you hear that joke? I saw his clip about... Uh, so there was a sick dude who got killed. Recently, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the jar. Yep. And he was like, okay, white people were like, okay, we're going to sit this one out. Yeah. They're like, who died? In the jar? Yeah. And I was like, I was losing my it shit. It was really funny. The whole, his whole set was really funny. Just Tinder. Yeah. He was like, he was ripping on Justin Trudeau a lot. And it was really funny. No, he is really good. And do you know... His podcast. He also has a podcast. I think he's called it Flagrant. Flagrant too. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah, definitely. What's the name of the Indian dude who sits with him? Like, there's a guy, yeah, Indian guy his, who sits with him. His name is Akash Singh. Yeah. Does he? Was he here as well? No, man. And they should have brought him. They brought uh, the other dude from the podcast, Mark Gagno. And Mark is funny, but like, there were so many just brown people and Punjabis in the crowd, and Akash Singh is. Uh, it's it's. When you're doing the Scotiabank Arena, bring out, bring out Akash Singh. Yeah. Like, that's, your, that's the second best comedian on that show. This is the whole place is sold out. Bring out Akash. I know yeah. he's busy and shit. Just bring him out. But, uh, yeah, I haven't seen him live, but I really like that guy. So Yeah, no, he's funny, too. And uh, I think he's kind of like best friends with Andrew Schultz as well. And I had no idea the other two guys who sit on the podcast that they were comedians, too. I thought they were like, you know, like, I don't know. Uh, lighting support or production support. I think they were when this podcast started. And then uh, I, I, I think only one of them does stand up and that's Mark. He's the white dude with a lot of hair. Yeah. He's all right. It's, it's not that he's not funny. He's funny. He's definitely funny. But it's just like, you know. I think Akash is definitely funny. Yeah. He's also uh, like just more stab. Like he's just more ag- that it, that audience would like that type of energy. Hmm. And it's not that, you know, Mark isn't funny. It's just like. It's one thing when you bring Mark to a small... This is freaking Scotiabank Arena, man. Bring out the freaking little Indian dude. We freaking... That's all we have in this... The whole audience, there's like 30% little Indians. So really? Like, a lot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge, huge Indian population. There's probably like... In that place, like there's probably fun. like 1,000, 2,000 Indians. No exaggeration. Damn, like... But it's like... It, it's, I think they sold like seven, 8,000 tickets. So the entire Scotiabank Arena was packed? Bro, I uh, I had some of the cheapest tickets in the place, and it was, I think it was perfectly sold out. I don't think there was open seats. Wow. And the Scotiabank is the same one where they play The baseball? Raptors play. Where the Raptors play. Yeah, they play basketball and hockey, where the Maple Leafs play. Interesting. So I've not been to Scotia, but where do they play the Jays game? Is what uh, that's the Sky Dome or what's called now the Rogers Center? Okay, so I've been to Rogers Center. I've never been to Scotia Arena, so that's my next place to go. Yeah, man, go watch a Raptors game. They're very free. They're cheap. 
they're cheap? Right now, they're a bit cheap. I don't know how well this team is going to do. So you can go on StubHub and like 20 minutes before the game starts, just buy tickets. That's it? Oh, I thought you had yeah. to do like reservation like months ago or whatever. No, you can go on StubHub. So people are selling tickets constantly, especially if it's not like a really good team. Yeah. So you can buy tickets for 20 bucks, 30 bucks, and then... Also, on this, you get inside, then you look on this app, what are the other seats that are available, and then you can sneak down and sit in those seats if they don't catch you. That's the way you do it. Let me know if you want to go. Yeah, yeah, I'll be down for that. I want to see a basketball game. And I think Raptors, I think even Raptors has a huge South Asian Browns, I think, fan massive, base. Massive, Like, that's, like, you're wearing, like, the hat as well. Yes. Like, I'm wearing a different hat. This is, like, a... I know, like a New York Yankees hat I'm wearing today. Dude, that's a Chicago White Sox hat. It uh, says Sox uh, on it. Uh, I like how you're just... Sorry, guys. I am new. I'm an immigrant. I do not know. I just bought the hat because I thought this was cool. Uh, it is cool. It's just... I, I just like the calligraphy on it. I was like, you know what? This makes me look like a tough guy. So that's why I kind of bought it. But... Yeah. Uh, uh, that's that's a good hat. Chicago... Ra- oh. Uh, it's the it's socks. The white socks, yeah. White socks. Okay, yep. okay, cool. How much do you think that uh, weed influences your comedy? Do you feel that it makes you more creative? Ah, uh, yeah, hundred uh, percent. But do you I smoke a couple before you know. Uh, I never, never smoke before performing. Okay. Because I like to be as myself as possible. Fair. I'm. I'm sure it's a bit more fun. I did once. I, it was weird because I uh, was doing a weed lounge and this place didn't have any ventilation. And while sitting around, I'm like, oh, we're all high. It's just so much smoke in the air that you get, you feel like you know you're high. Okay. And that was weird. But other than that, no, I never smoke weed before. Uh, I'll, if I, like, I smoke something because I'm going to go to bed, I'll sit down and rewrite a bunch of my jokes and see if I can come at them from different angles. And that's uh, definitely a, a positive. Like, there are some artists and comedians, like, so there's an uh, artist, no, not artist, like an old writer, his name is Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Okay. So, like, they, like Shakespeare and all that kind of stuff. And he used to do opium mm-hmm. before writing. And he used to do opium and fucking wrote the best poetry or whatever. It's called Kubla Khan. Wow. And he did opium and he wrote that and he needed to do opium to be able to produce like legendary stuff. Wow. So like opium is heroin. Heroin. And he, he used to do so heavy and used to get these dreams. And there's a movie actually on it that I've seen. Really? They, they made. Sorry, should we do opium? N- no, we shouldn't. Like that is like, you know, years ago. It makes it sound like. It feels like you're saying we should do opium. Well, it depends how desperate you are. <laughs> it, it makes it sound like you're saying that opium is good. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying <laughs> I'm saying opium is bad. Like opium it's is definitely horrible. Okay. But I've seen that a lot of artists you can do some good stuff on it. Like even though it destroys you, mm-hmm. but I think it gives you some sort of like a creative boost. Yeah. It kind of boosts your sadness, makes your experience intense, and then what you create. Yeah. It's powerful. You know, it's so true for a lot of these mind-altering substances is the creativity you can tap into is definitely different. Whether it's certain types of music, writing, even comedy, people like they're really messed up and tortured sometimes on drugs. Some of their best comedy is very interesting. Uh, It's kind of like method acting. So method acting, like you already know. So Jared Leto, when he was doing his, you know, Joker thing, which flopped anyways... But he used to text people, hey, about AIDS and, you know, dangerous stuff. And nobody could work with him on a set. Mm-hmm. And it kind of boosts him creativity. So I think sometimes taking chemicals, I don't know, could be a comparison to method acting. Mm-hmm. Which kind of boosts creativity for artists. But you don't do it. That's that's okay. And I don't think you should. Opium? Not opium, but... Method acting. No. <laughs> like any sort of chemical to make you creative. Like do you oh, like yeah, yeah, like no. artists have writer's block, right? Do you have a writer's block oh, too? Oh yeah, definitely. And how do you overcome it? Do you like smoke weed and then you start writing again? No, I try to get myself entertained. So go to something like a musical, like a live something. Something to get myself entertained. 
is the best way to come out of a writer's block for me. You have to kind of realize what kind of animal you are and what is a catalyst for you and your brain. What is your catalyst when you have a writer's block? Yeah, I like to get myself entertained by watching other people's art, whether it's going to a painting, paint gallery, uh, watching other people stand up, um, watching movies I haven't seen before, going to a, a, a live musical show. Interesting. Yeah, those things really inspire me. Hmm. Yeah. Watching somebody like that's very funny is just very inspiring or very just very much expressing themselves through their art is something that for me like I I appreciate it a lot. So like that gets me going in the right direction. Yeah, because sometimes I've seen some artists like you were talking about, you know, you were sad and then you became more creative. And there are a lot of artists who cannot write when they're happy. Mm -hmm. So like Andrew Schulz was saying that when he, like now he's successful so he's definitely making money mm -hmm. and he said that you know what i ran out of creative ideas because life is fucking comfortable hmm. and that's not true for me really because i i track every joke i've ever written down to the date i ever wrote it and okay. i mean every single joke because most of my jokes are in audio format when i write them i record it and then i go to evernote and i take the words and I move them around. So everything has a timestamp where I can measure how many jokes I came up with in the summer, the winter, the spring, the month, down to the day. And I think that's different for because I, I realize I write the most when I'm happy. Interesting. Yeah, I write the most when I'm happy. That's bizarre. Like, there are not a lot of artists who can claim that. I think it depends on what your discipline level is. Because mm -hmm. everything for me comes from a just like cold calling, right? It's just coming from a, you got to sit down and make yourself come up with material on these major subjects that you want to write about. Hmm. And then you have a process for that. Like right now, I can't write anything. Okay. Right now, I can't even do stand up. Why? Because there's a war happening. Right. Like I can't, I tried to do stand up. I started crying. I've never had that before. Because the war is affecting you. It's affecting me more than I, you would think it would. Which is interesting. Like you're not in the war. No. You are like thousands of miles away. Yeah. In a first world country, working from home. Yeah. Right? Kind of in an ideal situation. Like a completely different world almost feels like. But I can't focus on anything. Nothing seems funny right now. So like, and I didn't think that was me. I thought, I never thought. I've been doing comedy for eight years now. Even during the pandemic, I did comedy. I drove to people's driveways and stood there and did comedy while they stayed. They just opened their window. Correct. Uh, but I can't do any comedy right now. Like, it doesn't feel worth it for okay. the first time in my life. So you're like, so like, I know horrible things are happening right now with the Israel-Palestine war. And this is like off cap. For me, it's just like, I thought I'd be able to do stand up, but I didn't realize how much it affects you yeah like i have friends that live in tel aviv like mm. one of my good friends is a, is a rabbi like he's one of the guys i went to college with oh, so right. like when stuff happened in israel i called him like Correct. right i messaged him it's the first thing you do right and then the next day they just started like it's just man the amount of killing uh that happens in these situations it's uh yeah it's very sad and it's definitely wrong. And uh, it's good to have, like, I'm glad I do stand-up comedy because I have Jewish friends. And, you know, you live in Toronto, you're going to have all sorts of friends. Correct. Uh, but to just watch it day in and day out and see how little... Kids are getting, like... Bro, it's, it's especially as a father, it's possibly the worst thing I can see. And also, like, I also considered my job not to look away. Fair. Because that's kind of my only responsibility. It's like I can try to boost the signal and all of that, but just, like, I know I need to I need to feel this. And, yeah, when you're feeling it, you're not, like, I have friends that are able to do stand-up, and God bless them. I hope they, you know, keep doing it. I'm I just, like, I'm, this might take me a few more, you know. Like, I got I to gotta figure it out. I don't, don't know... This thing is definitely not stopping this war, from what I can tell. 
So it's just like I got to figure out. I'm not quitting, but like it's it's just right now. I didn't realize I'm such a creature of actually feeling and wanting myself to perform. I can't just do this because I have the material. I need to really actually want to be happy and perf- perform in a happy way because that's it comes across, um, especially because I'm not doing this for money, you know. Right. So it's just like it's an interesting observation about myself that I didn't realize. I always thought that I'm a comedian. Like I do other things, but I'm a comedian. I'm like, oh, you're not. You're actually very much a person and you do stand up comedy when you feel like it. And that was just like a very interesting realization. So yeah, well, that it, was very profound, actually. It, very touching, very profound. It shows you have empathy. You feel other people's pain. I was a refugee, man. So like for me, um, I fully understand that you can be born into any situation, right? You could just be born and you don't control that. You could be born in Australia to an Aborigines family. You can be born in the Great Depression as a 12-year-old working in a coal mine. You can be born as a, as a black child in the 1700s where you don't know if they'll let you stay with your parents. You could be born a monk in Tibet during the 60s. And it's as people, it's our decision to empathize with people because we know you don't control which situation you're born in. Um, and I think the stronger you can empathize with as many people as possible, I think the better person you are. I think that's really, you can measure how well somebody lived by how many people attend their funeral. And like, it's very much connected to how much empathy that person has towards their fellow human being, regardless, not even regardless, but because of whatever sexuality they have, religion they have, how they collect the group of people around them is kind of everything. So yeah, it's, it's a good realization and I'll see where the journey takes me. Um, but yeah, I haven't been able to sit down and put pen to paper or have a thought. Like it's been, it's been interesting. Like six weeks. That's the longest I've ever been in eight six years. Six weeks. Oh wow. Yeah. Just about, just about five weeks and a little bit. So yeah. So, yeah. Before no. that, I was doing like 20 shows a week. I mean, a month is like 20 shows, four shows a week, maybe. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. You know, now <laughs> I notice that you haven't posted about like your shows or something on Instagram. Like I follow it you. It seems so stupid. It seems like the dumbest thing in the world to tell somebody to come out and laugh at anything right now. Yeah. Like there are people getting killed and you're like, hey, why don't you crack a joke here? I'm like, yeah, sure. I can't crack a, a smile. Dude. It's the fir- I wake up in the morning. It's the first thing I think about. It's the last thing I think about before going to bed. But it's just like, you know. Actually, yeah. It's obviously not something I was planning to talk about. I don't have a lot more thoughts about it. But it's just like when you understand that. And I know this is a podcast and you have a thing. So we won't go too deep into the politics of it. But it is uh, just to see that like people will just count civilian deaths and just keep counting them and say like, it makes sense. Like we kind of need to do some other stuff. And this is the reason. So, like, you know, you know, civilians are just people. <laughs> like, I don't know how else to say it. So just like when people don't have uh, empathy and they don't view lives of one group of people the same as the other group of people, it's just a very um, scary realization. Uh, that not all people look at life the same way. They can justify, like, kids dying, but even just civilians, men and women dying, like, they can justify it very casually in their brain if that other person doesn't feel like them or look like them. And that's, like, a good thing to realize. Well, it kind of shows you that maybe not everyone is as kind and nice as you are. Mm-hmm. And if, if someone is given an opportunity to kind of, like, you know, go over you like yeah. they may not give a shit like mm. some of us might and the the only silver lining and the brightest silver lining is when you see people stand up for just what's right and it is humbling it is awe inspiring it is uh inspiring in so many levels when you see like one of the first people i saw stand up was this like trans jewish person and uh there's this group i think it's called jewish voices for peace And this person um, went to Capitol Hill, occupied this politician's room with a bunch of other uh, Jewish people. And I was watching uh, this person. 
And I was thinking that they, their lifestyle is not going to be approved by the people that he or she is standing up for. I don't know which way she, uh, you know, kind of defines herself or himself, but they didn't care that the other people were Muslim, probably don't care about gay rights or trans rights. They don't have anything to gain. And I was like, yeah, this is the best of us. You know, like there's no doubt that this is, this person has such a strong sense of justice and right and wrong that this person's moral compass is undeniable. It's a very cool thing to observe in times like this. There was a politician in Chicago, amazing. Like I saw him talk about it. Uh, Cornell West, who's running for president. A bunch of celebrities, not that it matters, but it's like there was a time you couldn't actually stand up for just human rights. They were like, this yep. doesn't feel good to that group and this group. And now it's just like, I really appreciate the humanity you see from people that don't belong to the same like religion. Exactly. Race. It's, and, and it unites so many Native American people because all these people have had a awakening where they were trying to get people to see what was just and not just. And when they see this situation, they're like, you know what? I think I can stand with the people dying. And that's a very important thing to see. It's like, we understand this is a losing cause. These people don't have a lot. They don't have any political clout. They don't have money. They don't have a machine behind them. That's and what nobody that's, cares. And that's who I want to stand with. Is like a very... Brave stand. Brave stand. And something that we... Sh I, I want to observe this, even if it hurts. Even if I can't sleep at night, which is the case. Even if I've lost six pounds... Which is, in the long run, like, nothing. I get to eat what I want, but, like, I, I can't do stand-up, and it's, like, the smallest price to pay. But, like, I'll wait until it feels right, but right now, uh, it doesn't feel right. Fair. Uh, extremely profound. Yeah, I did not expect to talk about any of that, but, uh, no. yeah, I don't, I think this stuff is universal, man. I don't think I said anything too crazy. <laughs> no, I think that's okay. I think we have to care about lives on both the side, and what I found the most interesting is that it's like winning a genetic lottery. If you're born in like a first world country in a nice neighborhood, mm -hmm. your life is set. Right. And if you're just born on the, let's say, in a war-torn country, you automatically are put a label, okay, this guy is dangerous, may have not done anything wrong, yeah. and you kind of have to live with it your entire life. You suffer, mm -hmm. you struggle, and like you may be a really good moral person. Mm -hmm. You have the right values. Just because you didn't win the genetic or, you know, the birth lottery, your life gets fucked. And I think pe more and more people are realizing that, that your birth can affect how people judge you or how people even perceive you. Mm -hmm. So I think, like, what we're getting out of this war is that there are good people who can go look beyond identity politics, realize that we live in an equal world, and death on both the sides is wrong, be it, you know... 100 percent yeah so yeah if you think low because i'm muslim it doesn't matter to me uh that a, a jewish baby has died you're an asshole you're <laughs> the middle you're Microsoft you're piece you're of the shit. middle of the ass yeah totally and vice versa and like i think that's actually how most people are i think it's only when you get into like governments and politics Correct. there's all this rhetoric but like I reached out to like most of my Jewish friends and a lot of them were like, yeah, this is so sad. Cause I'm like, Hey, how are you? I hope you guys are well. There's a lot of crazy stuff in the news. You know, I hope you're taking care of yourself because they, you know, they also see different things and they also feel attacked. Um, and yeah, you check in on people and they check in on you and like, you realize like people don't want this. Uh, Correct. the governments want. Yeah. People will be complacent sometimes or like it won't bother them because it doesn't the person doesn't look like them. And I've seen that, you know, and maybe a part of that is just natural. Uh, but a lot of people actually aren't that way. A, most people are actually it seems like very reasonable and empathetic. And, you know, they're willing to say, yeah, like what happened on this date was totally bad for, you know, all these civilians. And whatever happened on that date is also like and it's it's good. It's good to see the humanity and. Let's see what happens, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, no jokes. No, I think I think let's keep it that way. I don't think you have to push yourself into jokes and, you know, get yourself hurt. Mm -hmm. Comedy is an art. You, it's sacred to you. Yeah. 
and let's not you know make it something that you yeah i don't have to do it for a job and that's yeah. good because it would be you know it would be weird to be feeling sad all the time and going up there and acting you know like nothing's wrong uh, but yeah, as soon as I cry, I was performing and I, I started tearing up and I was like, oh, yeah. We're did that take happen it. to you? Like oh, you yeah, were performing yeah, yeah. and you felt sad and did you like still do it or you're like, oh, yeah, I got this. up there. I started doing it. I started tearing up around uh, a joke about giraffes. And then uh, I was just like, you, you could visibly see it. And I like kind of choked up and I was like, all right, guys, I got some stuff in personal life. And people like really understanding like, it's OK. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's nice. Yeah, it was nice, but uh, I was just like, oh, yeah. I've, and yeah. then you didn't do it. You're like, okay. Take yeah, a break. that's, yeah. Um, I'm supposed to, like, headline a show in two weeks, and it was booked from three months ago. So, like, I'll probably, I'll see. Like, I obligations are obviously obligations, but I think I'm going to take maybe even the year off, and that's, like, a long time for me. For From comedy? Yeah, because, like, yeah. Damn, I like, dude. That, that's we'll a see. lot of time. Well, I mean, I don't mean a full year. I just mean, like, it's November, December. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that is reasonable. I said I'm 20, Oh, no, not a year off. No, I don't have that I'm kind of time. I really like thing. stand up. So, yeah, I was thinking maybe like get back and maybe just, yeah, see if do one in December and see if my heart feels it. Mm. And then, uh, you know, like the thing is, it's affecting my life not doing it because I'm sadder because it's such a big outlet. Yeah. Though I'm like, I do, like, I got to take care of myself and like, I just got to figure out if it, if it doesn't feel right, then I don't. If it feels right, I do. We'll see. I'll call you out. It'll be fun. Yeah, no, I haven't seen... <laughs> you come out, I'm crying. It's like, I'm like, I'm not ready. Just it, crying. Yeah, like, if you give out, like, some intense comedy stuff about, like, politics, I'm like, because I am an emotional person, so I react very quickly as That's well. so funny. And I have a hard time hiding it. So if something crazy... So I'll be like, hey, let me take a look at the set first. Okay, nothing crazy, nothing crazy. <laughs> All right. Let's... Uh, I, I'll then join you. And I think to like to finish this topic, I would say I think it's a great thing you rec recognize the humanity thing. It's good that you like you are a f like of course you're doing all this job, but you're a father too. Mm -hmm. You have a son, so when you will be raising him, you will be not putting like random ideologies into his head. You'll be like you know work for the betterment of the human race. Yeah. And just because somebody has like a different hair or skin tone, that doesn't mean you have to hate them. Right people die on both the sides mm -hmm. and i think this perspective that that there is humanity in all the groups yeah this should be shown on the media side more no definitely you, do, you don't see that it's like this person is launching a missile this motherfucker is evil kill that son of a bitch Dude, it's crazy like I, like if you see news yeah. i'm like holy shit like the news is actually but you know what it's so i like to look at it as a positive yeah that you can see that the news is completely um, unimportant and controlled. I'm not saying it's unimportant. It's definitely very important. It drives a lot of casual people's narratives. But you can see, like, oh, this is something that's controlled. Like Correct. this is. So when they talked about, oh, Native American people are drunks. You c you can go back to like reading articles, whether it's the New York Times, Canadian newspaper, print, and you can see, like, oh, there is actually. An I wasn't noticing a narrative. I can see it so clearly in this that it must exist in everything that the news is doing, and it makes you fully understand that it's. It's a play. It's the fourth branch of the government. Yeah. Um, but it's good. It's good. Like in Pakistan, we knew that was the case, right? Like TV. Indian news is no better. Yeah. Like, I'm but not... it's, it's good to know, hey, like this isn't, you know, we consider this the first world and the free press. And you're like, no, it's not. I thought it was, but like I now like, oh, it's completely a mask off situation. Yeah. Uh, I would recommend uh, there's a really good book called A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, Z-I-N-N. Uh, I think he passed away possibly, and it's it, the book was written uh, a couple of decades ago. But the epilogue in this book, A People's History of the United States, the epilogue, he goes very clearly like, hey, I'm about to give you a history of the United States, but just so I don't seem impartial, I'm telling you that I'm writing this from the perspective of, and he goes, and like I, I'm going to paraphrase, an, uh, a Native American on the plains of the U.S., Rather than the colonizers coming, I'm going to write this from the perspective of, of an industrial worker that's 12 year old in a coal mine rather than the history of the industry of a black slave that's run away in the South rather than the perspective of the slave owner. And that was something I read when I was in high school or college. And I realized that's the way you want to look at life is through the eyes of the oppressed. 
it's good to understand all sides, but always see who are the most oppressed and then try to understand things from their perspective, which right now doesn't really happen that much. Like, yeah, right now, powerful people. Yeah, which, right now, all eyes should be on the Congo or Sudan, yeah, where our cell phones are made. Yeah, like slavery. Does slavery exist? Yeah, yeah, I mean, not hard and heavy. Hundred percent. It's just not in the field of the backyard of North America where it used to be. Yeah. Now it's in the backyard of the world. Correct. And yeah. it's a cell phone. Yeah, like all our Nike shoes. I don't know how many Chinese kids and Indian kids or Sudanese kids are kind yeah, of like yeah. building it's, this. So it's like that. It was a really good book where I'm just like the epilogue is just the way it started. I was like, oh, yeah, this is probably a really good way to look at life. And you you feel better. Even if you feel like we're losing because this is the, this is my community now, you feel like this is a good way to die. And that's kind of a good way to live. It's wow. like, yeah, because it, it depends what you stand for and who you stand with. Yeah, no, no. This is yeah, like, man, I'm kind of shook that you... you, well, what you I didn't even expect you to... I mean, none of this... I think we were getting off of comedy and I think we were just closing this out. But, you know, it's... These are important things that people think about right now, and it's an important time to think about it. Yeah, man. I think, I think, yeah, this is a good place to, I think, stop, man. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. No problem. And, you know, whatever, we'll do another episode sometime later. Sure. When we'll talk about mushrooms. It'll be fine. Yeah. And I, I still have those questions, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And we'll stop recording.